Okay. Frame sync pre roll for Sunday night, May 8, 2016. Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Good evening, friends, and welcome to this Sunday night, May 8, 2016 edition of Nightcast. Opening story tonight, the Canadian province of Alberta has grown more slowly with that uh, raging wildfire than originally feared, officials say. Laura Bicker has our opening report on this with the up-to-the-moment current details and situation there. After the panic and the fear, there is quiet in Fort McMurray, a city now nearly abandoned. They're still fighting to save what they can, and they may have finally reached a turning point, but it's taken its toll on those in the front line. I don't consider myself a hero, but I've met more heroes in this experience than I've ever thought existed. Sorry. Nature is finally lending a hand, and cooler weather conditions are beginning to help, but strong winds are fanning the flames towards the neighbouring province of Saskatchewan, and officials believe this wildfire could burn for weeks to come. We're about 20 kilometres from the edge of Fort McMurray, day eight, after these fires started, and still they are battling the flames. What they say they need is prolonged rainfall, but that's something they've not had here for over two months. Last evacuees have been evacuated from the city with the help of the army. The strategy has been one of containment as conditions made it too difficult to control. 80,000 people had to abandon their homes. The mass evacuation blocked the main roads and two people were killed in a car accident as they fled. Our hearts go out to their families. This is Mother's Day. I'm hoping in all of this crisis to spend a few minutes today with my own children. That not all of us can do that is definitely an awful tragedy. So many have lost so much. This is likely to be the most expensive natural disaster in Canada's history. Insurance losses alone will be billions of dollars. And for those who once lived here, they must be asking how and when will they ever get the chance to rebuild. Laura Bicker, BBC News, Fort McMurray. All right, friends, thank you, Laura. And friends, in spite of what you heard there uh, about it not being as quite as severe as... Uh, it hasn't grown to the extent that officials expected. Nonetheless, still, it's expected to be the most costly natural disaster, as, as you heard Laura Bicker say, in Canadian history. More than 100,000 residents of Fort McMurray have fled the blaze, many fleeing south to Edmonton. And friends, I don't have a video on this next story uh, from China, where they've had people trapped by a landslide. Rescue teams in... Let me, because I don't have video for that, let me just put our Nightcast logo up while I tell you about this. Rescue teams in China are trying to dig out 33 construction workers whose dormitory was engulfed by a landslide. Chinese media say eight workers have so far been pulled alive from the debris. And we hope to have video on that for you uh, soon. By tomorrow night, I'm sure we probably will. I do have another report. Let's see what I can... Just coming in, let me see what this is. A major rescue operation is underway for 91 people thought to be missing after a massive landslide 
in southern Cal- in southern China. More than 30 buildings in an industrial park in Shen- in Shenzhen were buried under tons of mud and construction waste. Okay, again, we'll be looking for more update, more material on that coming um, coming tomorrow. Um, now, some news. Again, no, I don't have any more video for us tonight. This is going to be a very short program. I, you did hear uh, Laura, one of the people in the first interview, make mention that for all those suffering, what's happened in the uh, province up there. I noticed one of our lights is out. Um, so maybe I appear a little darker, but I've been out in the sun most of the day. I'll tell you about that in a, in a moment. Uh, today is Mother's Day, and um, I'll have some comments and a scripture related to Mother's Day in, in just a moment for us here. Now, from North Korea, this is in today's news. Korean leader Kim Jong-un has told a gathering of the political and military elite that the country's nuclear weapons will not be used unless its sovereignty is threatened. However, movement observed at the country's nuclear site appears to be consistent with preparations for another nuclear test. And uh, I hope to have more on that. Well, actually, maybe no news is good news on that. But we'll keep you updated on that as things happen out of North, as, as news stories out of North Korea come available. Now, friends, I told, mentioned to you that um, I'd have a couple of scriptures related to Mother's Day, and um, in case she she tunes in once in a while, my sister does. So um, I hope my sister is tuning in tonight because she is the person closest to Mother's Day with me, uh, she and I having the same mother who our mother died in 2004, so it been a good 12 years ago, and uh, I did something a little special for my sister today. I got her a little surprise. I haven't gotten it to her yet, but I got her a little surprise. I've got a note out to her to tell her where it is, um, but let me see. I, I uh, Now, because of these fires... I spent most of the day myself digging uh, fire breaks in areas that are back in the forest where even though the county brought in or the state brought in a bulldozer from the Alabama Forestry Management Department when last month we had a fire that I helped the fire department with. Um, Actually, I dug some wide fire breaks up near... In, on my property that the fire chief noticed, hey, guys, the fire where he dug those fire breaks is just stopping at his fire break. And where you guys are down here, the rest of the hill, and, they, and I took the fire break down the hill all the way. So everywhere he's got that fire break raked, the fire's stopping. Where you guys are spraying with these little cans, the fire just going right around you, through you, beside you, and carrying on. You keep having to jump in front of it. You know, we need we need a good fire break here. But, of course, at this point, the fire has spread and spread and spread from where it came up on a, from another property, not my property, in the, in the, deep in the forest. And um, they decided, hey, it would be a good idea to get the forestry department out here with their big bulldozer and let them really create a fire break down the side of the of the uh, mountainside there that leads down to the creek off of my property and uh, create a fire break to stop it from going over to where there are homes along the ridge above the creek that that fire would just rip right through. So they got the bulldozer out. I let him tear up some of the fencing in my property to be able to get through where he needed to get through and go down that hill and create, he created a nice fire break. Sure enough, using that same principle, it stopped. And uh, so, I, but there are areas where that fire could come up from another part of the forest. And 
even though it would come up on my property and then I got fire breaks, it wouldn't shouldn't hurt anything else on my property. I got a fishing trailer back there that I really need to clean some pine strawn off all that. But I got fire breaks that would keep any fire coming up from getting to that unless somehow it jumped. So I, I, I got more I need to clean up and I need but if it came up a certain way, it would just catch, even on my property, past where the bulldozer did a fire break. And uh, I, I got a few acres here that I inherited from my dad. But uh, it would go on over to my neighbors if it came up from another way, which it could. Um, and there are places where it could cross the creek where there's trees knocked over the creek you know they're kind of beautiful the way they are but the fire could just burn right across it and come on up to an area that is past where the bulldozer created a fire break and that would be detrimental to my neighbors and the way that fire moved the other day and with these stories about that the way that blazing fire is going up there in canada and now it's about to blow into another province if the wind the way the wind is going Take it out of Alberta, but move it somewhere else. And uh, that's where your prayers, brethren, doing what Christ said do in Luke 21, 36, could really be meaningful to those people in Canada. Because if we move God by our prayers to, okay, they've had enough punishment for now. If, because maybe God left his hand of protection off because to get a lesson across before things really get nasty. God allowing the Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 cursings to happen there. And he'll let them happen here, too. I mean, of course, we've had wildfires here in the U.S., too. And are we waking up to the fact that when you see these kind of things, that even God even says, I'll make you the borrower, not the lender, when you're under cursings? A lot of signals and signs, if we read Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, I've heard some politicians start to say, hey, God's hand could be in this, and then as soon as the news media puts the pressure on them, they back off and wimp off like little chickens, like little, uh, you know, well, little chickens afraid to stand up. They start to mention God's word, but as soon as somebody comes at them hard, it's kind of like they're admitting they don't really know God's word. They don't really believe God's word. They might see something there, but they... They just don't have the connection with God to be able to stand and take the heat when people are pointing at you and saying, yeah, what about this? Well, just point them at the true scriptures and say, read it yourself in your own Bible. Start with Leviticus 26, go to Deuteronomy 28, and both of those chapters he starts out saying, if you obey, blessing, 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 prote and protection. Incredible protection with your enemies, he says, Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will put 10,000 to flight. How's that for magnifying ratios? On the other hand, though, he says, if you don't obey, cursing time. Instead of being the head, you'll be the tail. Instead of being the lender, you'll be the borrower. Instead of you chasing your enemy, I'll break the pride of your power if after I put the cursings on you, you continue to disobey me. And ultimately, Ezekiel 6.6, 6, all of your cities will be laid waste. All right, but brother, I'm going heavy ahead of myself. But, you, you know, you need to know these things. You need to know that certain things in the news are relative to how we treat God, whether we truly obey him or we, or, or we don't. And some of you who think you're obeying him are listening to ministers who are not telling you the truth from God's word about what you really should and should not be doing. We'll talk more about that another time. With this being Mother's Day today, I do want to go to a couple of scriptures that more or less relate to the day in a certain way. Uh, Jesus Christ was approached and told by certain people that said to him, let's put this here in front of us and bring it up on the screen, full screen for you for a moment. He was approached and they told him, uh, hey, your mother and your brothers are standing without here and they want to see you. You know, it says here, your, your mother and your brethren stand without desiring to see you. And I'm using more of the New King James language. That's the King James you see on the slide. 
And so um, you can read the parallels to this and how he responded with maybe different details from Matthew and from Mark. If you go to Mark 3, 33, or you go to Matthew 12, 48, I believe it is, and the verses before and after those references I just gave you, and you'll see more you'll see more detail than this. The next verse in Luke, Luke 8, 21, though, Christ said, he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brothers, my brethren, are these which hear the word of God and do it. Now, he was speaking to them back in that time, but brethren, he was also speaking to us today. My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. That was Jesus Christ speaking right there in Luke 8, verses 20, 21. Again, the parallel chapters, you might find some value in looking up and seeing, oh, there's some detail here that Luke didn't give, and there's some detail in Matthew that's different from the detail that Mark gave. And that's kind of like when you get three people reporting on a traffic accident, you know, maybe one sees it from this angle, another sees it from this angle over here, and somebody sees it over here, and their reports are all going to be the same, except their details are going to be. One's going to have these details, another's going to have different details. Another's going to have this. Detail. Now, none of the details conflict, but the guy standing in this position is going to see different angle than the guy over here saw, and so he may see something he didn't see, but all of that happened in the same incident. Same with the Gospels and the Gospel writers. Matthew saw from his point of view and from his thinking, Luke from his and Mark from his. And so uh, we just have two verses that relate to this. And Mark and Matthew, I think there's three verses that relate to this same thing where Christ, Mother Mary, and his brothers, his physical blood brothers, were there wanting to see him when he was at the where he was here and with all the people around him. And he, he used that opportunity to make a point he wanted us today to get by answering and saying to them, my mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. This is the detail that Luke brings in that the others don't bring in. You know, he, the others bring it in in a more poetic way where he says, uh, my mother and my brethren are, are you guys that are here, basically. Uh, you know, having done that, I, I should let me flip there for you. You, you know, if you got your own Bible, go there with me. Matthew twelve forty eight. There's one area. Let's read those because even though I don't have a slide up, let me just read those to you. In Matthew twelve, let's begin in verse forty six. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then verse forty seven. One said unto him, Behold, your mother and your brethren stand without desiring to speak with you. Now, it does repeat that between verse 46 and verse 47. One says, While he was speaking, his mother and brethren were there wanting to speak to him. And then one said to him. So it says they were there wanting to speak to him. And it says somebody told him that they were there. Behold, your mother and your brethren stand without, outside there, desiring to speak with you. But, verse 48, he answered and said, unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who is my brothers? My brethren. And verse 49, He stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my brethren. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I missed part of that. He said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Now, he did that gesturing toward his disciples. Behold, my mother and my brethren. Christ making that point. And then, of course, here in Luke, he added, so he not only did that, which Luke left out, you see, but Matthew and Mark left out the fact that he said these words, my mother and my brethren are them which hear the word of God and do it. So it sounds like if you put it all together, all the reports together, it sounds like Christ motioned into his toward his disciples and said, after asking the question, which Luke doesn't bring out that he asked the question, where Christ said, who is my mother and who are my brethren? 
He uses this occasion to make a point. He first of all asks the question and to get everybody's attention. Oh, wow. Well, who is Christ's mother? Well, his mother was just standing without there, his physical blood mother. But spiritually, Christ looked at it this way and wanted us to get this point. He's asking us, you know, he's not trying to trick us. He's trying to help us think beyond the physical, the physical blood. You know, like, I've lost my mother. Many of you have lost your mother. In other words, you know, your mother has died. And my mother has died, and she's coming up in a resurrection. And uh, hooray, I'm going to look forward to that day when I get to see my mother again. Believe you me, and is there going to be some hugging. And I know my sister and my brother also look forward to seeing our mother. Deb, I know you look forward to that. My sister and I were shoulder to shoulder on the day... My mother died as together we were kneeling at the bedside of where my mom had just died. And um, we're both, and my brother too, going to look. My brother had just come over that morning and talked mom into letting me and her shampoo her hair, which she said, no, I don't want to do that. And my brother, yeah, mom, come on, you need. And so my brother was so insistent, thank you, Tracy, that that my mom gave in. And then on, while my brother was on the way home, mom died. And uh, boy, was I thankful that we had shampooed her hair while she was still alive, because we, my brother and I, had to get, you know, I think I held mom up while he shampooed her hair in the shower, and uh, that would have been very hard to do after she died. And so. Um, I was very glad we did that before she died because it just having her hair nicely, freshly shampooed, you know, for the funeral and the viewing, you know, our having done that ourselves was just kind of nice. But Christ is making the point here that uh, for those of us who God is, has called and is working with, He's trying to elevate your thinking beyond just the physical right here. You know, your physical mom or dad or, or brethren, you know, or brothers. Your mother and your brethren are these, as he motioned toward the disciples. And, you know, that means and he only worked with those few disciples. Uh, the church is a little bigger today, even though we are scattered like crazy. A very uh, peculiar time in a way, but... As long as we focus on what Christ said do, if we keep our attention on Luke 21, 36, even though we're scattered, it won't matter. You know, we can be together in a certain way if we're all watching what Christ told us to watch and praying about it. Puts us in the same boat no matter where we are, over here, over there, over yonder. And there's a promise at the end of that, in, at the end of verse 36 in Luke 21, where Christ says, uh, if you do that, he says, watch and pray always, so that you may be accounted worthy to escape what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next? We're watching the first four seals that are active now. The fifth seal had a type was reported of in, Mark's, uh, in, in Fox's book of martyrs and the crusades, the martyrdom of God's saints. But that's a small, even with the volumes that Fox wrote, that's... As God's end time apostle Herbert put it, that's a small number of martyrs as compared to what's coming in the great tribulation of martyrdom that's going to be bigger than you can imagine. Let me throw this slide up on the screen just for a moment here. Uh, here's a picture of the crown of the Holy Roman Empire, and around that I've put some labels to tell, remind you that this crown will be worn again for its last time. It's been worn six times so far under six kings. Five are fallen. One came from 1936 to 1945. Mussolini, he was the, the sixth king. Now he's fallen. He's And the whole thing is dormant again. Uh, it went dormant after Napoleon lost the Battle of 1814. That ended 1260 years continuous reign. Yeah, Napoleon did a comeback in 1815 attempting the Battle of Waterloo, which everybody hears about. 
But that was after he already lost the kingdom. He already lost the continuous reign of the kingdom. And his comeback effort was a failure, too. So he had two failing wars in a row, one in 1814, Battle of Waterloo in 1815. And the one the year before in 1814, that ended the reign of the Holy Roman Empire, the continuous 1260-year reign under five kings, beginning with Justinian. Let's just go through those real quickly for a moment. Beginning with Justinian, followed by here's a portrait of the Pope. My buttons are just stuck up, stuck, but let me get them freed up here. Here's a portrait of the Pope crowning uh, Charlemagne. He was the second king of the five that are fallen. Then Otto the Great takes third position. He's the third of the five kings that are fallen. The fourth of those five kings that are fallen was Charles the fifth. And then the fifth king of the five that are fallen was, as I was just mentioning, Napoleon. And then... That, and then Napoleon, uh, he ended. He ended the 1260-year continuous reign in 1814. So we we run from 554 with Justinian up here down to 1814, continuous through five kings. And then the Holy Roman Empire goes into dormancy from 1814 when Napoleon la lost that battle, that major battle in 1814. Uh, it's The Holy Roman Empire has gone dormant until 1936, when Napoleon got a concordant from the Vatican, and he went into Ethiopia and conquered little Ethiopia, and then began shouting to the world that he, as Il Duce, the new Roman Caesar, had revived the Holy Roman Empire. Now, it didn't have great attentive world impact, but many did see the pact that Mussolini made with Hitler and that horrible situation World War II with Hitler was and Mussolini was right there encouraging Hitler on and uh, even though Hitler was the main culprit in World War II Mussolini was the sixth king of the holy revived Holy Roman Empire now it didn't have the major consequence it's going to have the next time when the seventh king revives it. And, you know, and just a reminder that Mussolini's reign ran a year less than Napoleon. Napoleon was in reign from, for nine and a half years between uh, the fall of 1804 to the spring of 1814. Napoleon had his reign from 1936 to the spring, fall of 1936 to the spring of 1945, when on April 28th, 1945, he was shot in the belly along with his comrades and his mistress, and then they were all hung upside down from the canopy of an SO gasoline station in Italy. But uh, Mussolini, he was the sixth king, and now the verse in Revelation 17, verse 10, that, that mentions there are seven kings, and it says five are fallen. These five, again, uh, Justinian, uh, Charlemagne, Otto the Great. Charles IV, I'm sorry, Charles V, he was the fourth king, and uh, that gets kind of tricky sometimes. He was the fourth of the five kings that are fallen, but he was called Charles V. There were four Charleses preceding him, uh, but only he of uh, those Charles were, were emperors over the Holy Roman Empire, and then the fifth one was Napoleon, ending that reign from 554 with Justinian to 1814 with Napoleon, and then again, a little bit of a reprisal, a little bit of a, a coming out of dormancy, a revival, a restoration of the Holy Roman Empire from 1936 to 1945. Now that Holy Roman Empire is dormant again since 1945 until whoever it will be, we don't know yet, who the 10 leaders from Europe will pick to be their new dictator, their new emperor, who the pope maybe the current one in office maybe one who's over in a closet or you know hidden over in the Vatican that may come forward again or maybe somebody else totally altogether the Vatican will provide a pope when this is going to happen and it could happen very soon that this crown will be worn again for its last time as the Holy Roman Empire is revived for its seventh and final time and this time when it's revived it will kick off the fifth seal that Jesus Christ termed in plain language in Matthew 24 verse 
21, 22, 20, 21, 22, he called it the Great Tribulation, calling it a time of mega trouble, a time of trouble so great that no time since the beginning of the world to this time when it comes, nor ever after, is going to be as bad as what happens during this Great Tribulation. Coming soon. And uh, this crown that you see in the center of this picture is an actual picture of that crown that's now on display in the royal treasury in Vienna, Austria. You can go there and see it yourself with your own eyeballs if you want to. It's in a big glass cage. It's well guarded. You won't walk out of that building with it. But it will be transported from Vienna to Frankfurt, Germany once those 10 liters once it comes down to 10 liters, five from the east, five from the west, once they choose a new emperor who the pope will then, as he has done with the past kings, many of the past kings that are mentioned in Revelation 17, 10 as part of the seven kings that, keep, that either keep going or revive that Holy Roman Empire, he'll fly over to Frankfurt, Germany, to the second floor of the Romer building where that houses the Kaiser's Hall, the, the Emperor's Hall, in which they take this crown and put it on the head of a the final and seventh king of the Holy Roman Empire. This, which this one the Bible calls the Beast, and the Pope who comes over and holds the coronation ceremony and puts this crown on his head is called the False Prophet, and that Beast will commence round three of world war. Uh, in consort with the Vatican and the Pope, the false prophet, he will issue an ultimatum saying, no more Sabbath worship. If you Judaize and try to not work on the Sabbath, you'll be announced anathema and you'll be put to death by the Roman government, by the beast. They'll either burn you at the stake or they'll cut off your head, torture you first hoping you'll recant of your refusal to work on the Sabbath, which they will require everyone to do, or, again, they'll kill you. You'll be a martyr. It'll be the greatest martyrdom of God's saints to ever occur. Make the Holy Cross look like a drop in the bucket. Now, the only people who... And, and nobody will be able to preach that you should keep the Sabbath either, so it'll be the ultimate famine of God's Word, with this exception being the two witnesses, and only them. They'll be able to burn up their enemies by fire from their mouths. But otherwise, it'll be just an ultimate famine of God's Word. And the greatest martyrdom of God's saints, it'll be the time when that promise that Christ gave at the end of Luke 21, 36, where he said, if you watch and pray always, which our program tries to help you to do, then Christ says, the carrot is this. He says, do these two things so that you may be accounted worthy to escape what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next? This thing, the Great Tribulation. It hasn't happened yet except for a type during the Crusades and Fox's Book of Martyrs reports you know, of martyrdom of God's saints, but nothing like what's coming in the time of trouble that Christ said is the greatest time of trouble since the beginning of the world, which he called the Great Tribulation, just ahead of us. Uh, that fifth seal has not has just not occurred yet. These four seals that precede it, they're active. They've been active since Christ, and they're progressively active. So they've slowly, through the centuries, they've we've had war, the second seal. You know, and we've had false... Religious deception ever since Christ, too, even reported of by the apostle Paul in Galatians, when he said they're preaching another Jesus, and he warned, don't, don't, don't buy into that other Jesus they're preaching. They're not preaching the what Jesus preached. They're not preaching the message. They preach a message about Christ, but they take his name, but they don't preach the message he preached about the kingdom of God coming to this earth. And so they deceive people, and Christ himself warned, as he explained in plain language, the first seal from the book of Revelation depicted by a white horse. He said, many will come in my name, saying, oh yeah, that Jesus is the Christ, and yet they'll deceive many, because they don't tell the whole story. They just tell you about Christ, and they don't tell you what Christ said. 
And then they, you know, and then what they do preach is uh, is contrary to what Christ said, and this is not even in the Bible. They make up a bunch of stuff. And that's what your ministers have done, because you know they want they they want you happy. They preach what you want them to preach, soft things. The second seal depicted in Revelation by a red horse. Jesus Christ described in plain language as war and rumors of war and world war even, which we finally had last century, beginning in 1914 with World War I, and then later, that ended in 1919, and then later in 1938-39 with World War II that ended one round of it. The European theater ended in uh, 1945. Was it later that year, the Pacific Theater, Japan? Yeah, same same year, but later, months later, that you know, then it, the Pacific Theater ended. So all of that ended in 1945. Now we're waiting for round three to occur, which will occur when the fifth seal, over there on the far right side, the fifth seal, when that becomes active. And we've got wars, you know, the news is full of wars ever since Christ, but more, more wars now than ever before. So the things have been progressive, progressing right along. And Christ said, as you see them become really blossom, when you see them blossom out, when it, as he gave a comparison to how a tree blossoms out after its leaves, uh, limbs become tender, you know, he said, you know, summer's nigh. And he said, likewise, you know, the kingdom of God is near when you see these seals become start to blossom. And we're seeing more uh, famine around the world. We're seeing more, that's the third seal, Christ called it Limus. And, no, I'm sorry, yeah, you call it limus. Limus is the Greek word for famine, scarcity of food. And the fourth seal depicted by a pale horse, the third seal depicted by a black horse, limus, famine. The fourth seal depicted by a pale horse with a rider whose name's death. Jesus Christ described that primarily as limus, meaning pestilence, disease epidemics, the plagues of Egypt. He also said that between the third and fifth seal, there would be seismus, increasing Blossoming seismic activity, commotions in the air, gale force winds of all kind, uh, and commotions on the ground, which give they give the example of earthquakes, but commotions on the ground include tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, uh, floodings, and wildfires, like we're seeing in Canada right now. And that's a part of this fourth seal because it happens between the third and fifth seal. So we see these things blossoming. And he says, and, and even the story tonight out of China with the landslides, that's a commotion for, on the ground. And when you see these things blossom, one, one story after another, boom, 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 he said, know that the kingdom of God is near. And, and so how near? Well, once the fifth seal, the next major event in prophecy happens, we're basically three and a half years because he says, when that begins, it begins a three-and-a-half-year, 1,260-day period. Now, uh, it, that fifth seal is not the whole picture. The whole picture goes to the seventh seal uh, after the sixth seal. And the seventh seal is the day of the Lord. That's the, that's the seven trumpets and the seven last plagues. And the day of the Lord, like prophecy, like God's Word says, a day in prophecy is as a year. So this day of the Lord is a one-year-long thing, and you take that year away from three and a half years, that leaves you two and a half years, about two and a half years, for the fifth seal to play out what it happens there, the wrath of Satan. That's not the wrath of God. That's the wrath of man and Satan during the fifth seal, the Great Tribulation. That's the next major thing to happen in prophecy. Then there's a few days of a astro signs in the sun, moon, and the stars. Then, of all those who are accounted worthy to escape, 144,000 of them are sealed over there in the wilderness. And, and so everybody who gets to escape, you get that promise to escape whether you're going to make it into the first resurrection or not. So that means even your kids may be able to be taken to the place of safety even though they're not going to be transformed when Christ returns. They're going to live over as physical beings into the world tomorrow. Uh, you know, so there, there's going to be more than 144,000 in the place of nourishment, protection, safety, final training over there. Now look, we'll talk more on those details another time. Let me come back with you. And... Uh, See, how do I get us back here? Okay. All right, let me come back with you and let's, uh, let's see, let's, let's wrap this up for tonight. 
Where was I here? I was reading to you uh, Matthew 12, 48, roughly, where uh, Christ asked, who's my mother? Who's my brothers? And spiritually, he's saying, look, let's, let's step up. Let's, let's step up a notch. Let's get above the physical. Yeah, your mother and your dad, they were these certain people. They were, you know, one each. And your blood and very important people and to be honored. You know, the fifth command is the only one with a promise to it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days on this earth may be long and blessed and you be healthy and receive blessing by just honoring your parents. So that, that's a wonderful thing to do. And those are wonderful people to be honored. Yes, absolutely. And so by saying, by saying let's step up a notch, you know, that wonderful thing is the and physical and your mother, your dad, my mom, my dad, my sister's mom and dad, my brother's mom and dad, they, they're, they're just related to each of us in the family, in our family. Christ, by coming up a notch, he's talking about the whole body of Christ who God has called when he says, my mother, my brethren, when he pointed to his disciples who were the beginning of the church. And on the day of Pentecost. But he worked with those 12, and then those 12 worked with many others after Christ was crucified and went to heaven. And as he said, you know, once I'm gone, your greater works than I did, you're going to do because I'm at my Father's right hand. And even in these latter days, we're going to begin to see some greater works hold on to your hat you know granny goose is things are going to be happening here ahead of us um, some pretty magnificent things just hold on to your hat um, and keep watching and keep praying but let's see if we can finish this and then i then i'll i'll let you go we'll sign off for tonight after that and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and he said my mother and my brethren spiritually Many more than just his brother, his mother, and his brothers physically in that family. Spiritually, these for who? And then verse uh, chapter uh, verse fifty of Matthew twelve is similar to this verse twenty one of Luke eight, where Christ says, "For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother, and sister, and mother." So in verse 50, God says it very similar to the way Luke reports it here in verse 21 of Luke 8. But you see you're getting different perspective by going to the different uh, gospel writers way they each brought it in. Now, I didn't mean to put that. My slides of the Bible verses are not to be credited to the BBC here, so I'm sorry about that. I should have pushed a different button, but let me see. Uh, what was the other? Mark 3, verse 33. Real easy one to remember if you want to go look that up in your own Bible. I'm just giving you the middle verse. You can easily get to the other verses by going to Mark 3, verse 33. Let's read those real quick before I close up for tonight, brethren, our friends. I know all of you not who watch this are not in the church, and tonight I'm really pointing something toward our church members. Uh, but... You know, this is in your Bible. And he, uh, let's look at uh, beginning in verse 31 in Mark 3 before we close up tonight. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without sent unto him, calling him. You know, hey, Jesus, we need to talk to you. Hey, we'd like to talk to you. And the multitude sat about him, verse 32, and they said unto him, Hey, behold, hey, look, uh, Jesus, your, your mom, your brothers, they're, they're, they're out there seeking you. And, verse 33, Jesus answered them, saying, here, here he's answering with a question, as he would often do with a question, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And verse 34, he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Now, you know, now see, this is the way Mark is reporting it. Matthew adds the point that he gestured toward his disciples. But here in verse 34 of Mark 3, it just simply says, And he looked round about him on them which sat about him. He looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. 
you know, to, to, to them which said about him, and who was about him, his disciples. Verse 35, for, whose, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. He, Mark pretty much reports it in verse 35 of Mark 3, the same way Matthew reported it in Matthew 12, verse 50. And uh, Luke's did more of a summary of it, as he said here. Uh, he answered them and said unto them, My brother, uh, my, my mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. All right, brethren, a little different program tonight here on Nightcast as we present the day's current news related to to the Bible and prophecy to you, today being Mother's Day, a little different. And God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again tomorrow night, Monday night, with more of the day's current news here. Find my right closing button there. Here on Nightcast. Thanks for joining me tonight, brethren, on Mother's Day. And uh, remember how Christ presented it. And do honor. If your mother's alive especially, do with whatever time is left today for you, do give some honor to your mom. Even if you just call her and tell her you love her. And if she's died, maybe tell God, God, I sure look forward to seeing my mom when you bring her up out of that grave. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. All right, brethren, thank you for joining me tonight. Friends, thank you for joining me tonight. God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again, as I was saying, tomorrow night, Monday night. Until next time, your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, for Nightcast, saying so long and good night, friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.